Hello everyone, my name is Michael Pichat, and I just want to thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to see the presentation I prepared for you all today. And now, the title of my talk is Your Presentation Sucks, but believe it or not, I'm actually not going to be talking about the common problems with a lot of presentations today, because that would be redundant. If you're in the audience right now, you already know that there's a problem. You already know that you sat through tons of terrible presentations. In the famous words of Doug Jeffries, uh, all presentations basically follow the same format. They go, how I'm going to bore you, I bore you, and how I bored you. And the problem with that is it's a structure that needs to be broken. And my goal with this presentation today is that I will give you all a critical lens. I will give you the skills to be able to look at other presenters in a different way. Really, you won't be able to look at your own presentations in the same way after this. But regarding my credentials on the subject, uh, I've taken public speaking, I've taken professional communication, and uh, I won the public speaking contest back in 2009. But the exciting thing isn't that I won the public speaking contest, it's that I won it with a speech titled The Ethics of Video Game Design. Yeah, I can't even think of a more boring presentation title, but what I learned is that it's not always the subject that you're talking about. The enthusiasm, the way you spin your presentation, the way you present it, that ultimately is what decides whether or not a presentation is successful or not. With the skills that I'm going to go over today, you'll learn that you can even give a presentation on a mundane topic, but as long as you use the skills that I talk about, you can still entice your audience. So this presentation is going to be broken up into two parts. We're going to be talking about you as a presenter, the way you talk, what you wear. We're then going to talk about your content, what actually goes inside your slides, what actually goes inside your presentation. And I'm going to have a third part on implementation, like what you should actually start doing right now. Because a lot of talks on presentation skills give great tips, but then they don't actually tell you how to start implementing it in your presentations right now. So the first thing that's always on everyone's mind is what should you wear? when you go to your presentation. And this is a topic that is debated so much, but really, the best rule of thumb is to dress one step above your audience. If you're an audience full of people wearing dress shirts, wear a dress shirt and a tie. If you're an audience full of people wearing dress shirts and ties, wear a suit. If you have no idea what your audience is gonna wear, be formal. Because when you dress formally, you tell or send a message out to everyone that you've already taken steps to prepare for your presentation. Don't fall for the common trap of thinking, oh, I'm going to dress up super casual and blend in with everyone else, because sometimes that might send a message that you actually don't care. Always think about that, and dress more on the formal end of things, because that's just safer. The next topic is body language and gestures. Now, when you go up in front of people for a presentation, the fight or flight response actually activates, and adrenaline flushes through your body. Now, what happens is usually it causes involuntary muscle movements, waddling. This was one of my biggest problems ever. You wouldn't even believe how many presentations I would go. I went through a 15-minute long presentation for the RIT-48 when pitching attache, just talking like this for the entire 15 minutes. And the funniest part, while I was giving the presentation, and rather after it, I was like, yeah, I nailed that presentation, best thing. But then watching the video later, I was like, oh my god. So waddling is caused by that adrenaline rush. And a more advanced stage of that is called crawling, where you start walking back and forth, and you're just walking for no reason. The problem with these things is that these are movements that have no expression. They don't mean anything. So the way you combat that is spread your feet out about shoulder width apart, pretend your feet are nailed, glued to the floor, and stand still. What people don't know is that when you stand still, you still have all this range of motion to give gestures, to lean forward, to lean backward. And when you stand still, when you actually decide to move, you can do it to emphasize a point, and it means so much more than when you're just and we'll see walking back and forth, back and forth. What happens is the message you give when you're going back and forth is that I'm uncomfortable. I'm letting my nerves get the best of me. And if your audience knows that you're uncomfortable, 
they start to get uncomfortable. One thing that we can all agree on is that in our Western culture, eye contact is associated with telling the truth. Like, did you, did you steal that from me? Look me in the eye and tell me the truth. So because of that, you basically have to look at your audience. If you're not looking at your audience, if you're not maintaining eye contact, not only is it a barrier, it's kind of like you're distant. You're not certain of what you're saying. I'm not gonna tell you that your audience thinks you're lying, but they will think on a subconscious level that you're not exactly certain of what you're saying. So the best way to do this is practice your presentation in front of a mirror staring at yourself. Or you could be like me and download a picture of an audience staring back at you and put that full screen on your computer while you go through your speaking points. That works too. It's a little creepy because they don't move or blink at all. So, but <laughs> definitely something to try as well. I want to give a quick side note on, on cue cards and outlines. And what I've what I wanted to say is, is that you shouldn't use them, because they suck. Um, if you are using cue cards and outlines in your presentation, you're basically, one, setting a barrier again between you and your audience. And it just communicates that you could have practiced more. Because when you outline your speaking points and practice them beforehand, you shouldn't need to have them in front of you, right? Your audience will see that. and. If at any time while you're practicing, you're starting to think, oh, you know, crap, I gotta need, I'm going to need a bunch of note cards for my presentation, you should be saying I need to be practicing more for my presentation because when you get your, your speaking points down to a T, you don't need them. And like I was just talking about, eye contact. If you're taking your eyes off your audience and looking back at these speaking points and back up, there's a disconnect. And again, it communicates that you're uncertain about what you're saying. So this is the biggest problem that I'm sure everyone is familiar with. Verbal filler. Um, uh, uh, the reason why we have verbal filler is because we all have this irrational fear of... We're afraid of it. We're so scared of silence. And the thing is, silence isn't scary. In fact, it's your friend. What you'll find out when you get, uh, when you practice public speaking enough, you can actually use silence to your advantage in something called the power of the pause. What you do is you say a point, and to emphasize that point, you pause. You let your audience dwell on that for a moment. How much better is silence than, um, uh, I was going to sort of, well, if I just, no. Silence. Embrace it. It's your friend. I think the most important thing I was ever taught with regards to delivery of a presentation is everyone strives for that very casual presentation style where it seems like you're talking to your audience at lunch. Yeah. The way you accomplish that is by pretending that your whole audience is one person. You practice your presentation like your audience is one person. And what you do is when you deliver your presentation like you're talking to only one person, each person in your audience feels like they're getting a personal talk to themselves. And the coolest thing about this is that when you practice this enough, the size of your audience kind of becomes irrelevant. This, this exact same talk I could give in Galasano Auditorium, the, the Gordon Fieldhouse, because I've practiced to talk to you all as if I'm talking to each, and one, of, each one of you individually. Another way to engage your audience, and this is something you'll see I do a lot in the middle of my presentations, is ask questions. Don't wait for the answer, just ask a question. Because what that does is it plants a seed of thought in your audience members, and they think about your presentation. They think of an answer. And if they're thinking about your presentation, that means they're engaged. So think of small questions to add, to ask throughout your talk. Another great way to get your points inside the heads of your audience members is to tell a story. Now, if you ever watch TED Talks, these people are the masters of this. They tell compelling stories that still manages to tie back to the points that they're discussing about. If you can do that, your audience is more likely to remember the story as well as the points with it, as opposed to just going through a laundry list of facts that you're presenting to them. 
So if you can tell a story in your presentation, try and find a way to tie it back to your points and to your audience. So that was the portion devoted to you and your delivery. Uh, from here on out, we're going to talk about the content, what actually goes in your presentation. And this is probably the most important slide in this entire presentation. If you don't remember anything from today, please remember this. Your slides are not your speaking notes. What happened is, people always get on me on this, and I hate to be that guy, but PowerPoint single-handedly killed the art of presentations. And people are like, don't blame PowerPoint, it's not PowerPoint. Yes, it is. Okay, because before PowerPoint, what were people using? Whiteboards? Uh, poster boards? The slide projector thing where you could only show one picture at a time? That's what people were using before. PowerPoint came out and then people started putting their speaking notes in their slides. I mean, can you even think of a more... When your speaking notes are in your slides, it's like reading along to a child. Have you ever, like, you know, today Alice went on a journey. It's the same thing. You're, you're reading your points out to your audience. It puts down their intelligence and there's really no reason for them to pay attention. When you put your speaking points in your slide, 5% of your audience focuses on the slides and they're not listening to you. Another 5% of your audience is listening to you and they're not even reading your slides. The other 90% of your audience have embarked on a journey of personal self-reflection. You're thinking about what courses to register for next quarter. Here's the world, finds the world, it's the difference. And it's really funny when you think about this, like when you really become critical of other people's slides, you start to notice that our professors are like the perfect storm of bad presentations. They read directly off their slides, which are posted online, while we are all sitting in front of computers. You can't even think of a worse situation for them to be in, so, you know, I, I feel sorry for them in that regard. Now, this slide itself shows the technologies that I'm using for a senior project. My team is, not just me, it's a senior project team. And when we were actually making the slides for our final presentation, we were listing it out like this, but then to make it more visual, and this is an exercise you can all try to do when you're doing your slides in the future, constantly ask yourself how can you transform what's on your slide into pictures. And what we found is instead of putting the information we were going to say about each tool and the name of the tool, you could just put the logos of the tool and you could have them each show up one by one and you could talk about each one. When you selectively reveal things to your audience, it helps them to take in the visual aid and your message at the same time. When it's words, it's there's a conflict. They have to read it and still listen to you at the same time. So I don't even need to go into how poor of a practice that is. I think you get the point. But this is great and all. I'm sure some of you are thinking this is much easier said than done. Because, I mean, let's face it. We're software engineers. We need to give presentations where we present diagrams like this. This is bad. Um, if you ever have to present a gigantic UML document, Break it down. Break it down into smaller components. Walk your audience through that. And you can even use the animations in your presentation software to selectively reveal the parts of your diagram you want to talk about. Now, before you even invest time in that, probably another important thing you need to ask yourself is, do I really need this diagram in my presentation? Think about it. If you are giving a presentation to your sponsor, do they need to see something as low level as a class diagram? Now, I understand for class, right? For our courses, we always put in our UML diagrams because it shows, hey, we did work. Of course, do that. But I'm saying in the real world, when you're out in, in industry or when you're presenting to a sponsor, you don't need to show this crazy low level stuff. It'll fly over their head. So, and of course, once they're not thinking about your presentation, they, they're not listening to what you're saying. I didn't want to put this in my presentation, but I, I've seen them being used in more than one presentation, and that's a problem because that's greater than zero. Uh, how do I sum up this slide in one word? Don't! Just don't do it. Under no, if a team member is like, well, maybe just no. Say no. 
And if they ask why, it's because they're not funny. Memes aren't funny. They really aren't. And if you think I'm lying, next time you're in class and you see someone browsing Reddit, don't look at their screen. Look at their face. I'm, I'm serious. Look at their face. You'll see like a full page uh, Scumbag Steve image and it'll just be like scrolling with this complete vacant expression on their face. So I don't think I need to make much of an argument. They're unprofessional. They're unnecessary. They do not belong in your slides. You gotta put up the volume. One second, guys. Do you know where I plug in the audio? Oh, no. So I want to also give a quick note about embedding videos into your presentation. So a quick side note about embedded videos. If you want to have a video in your presentation, be sure to download it beforehand and embed it directly into your presentation rather than just putting a YouTube video link that you need to copy and paste and then go to another web browser. When you do this, not only do you save time for your presentation, you don't break your flow, and you don't even need an internet connection because you're running a copy of the video locally. Make sure your video is full screen, it takes up the entire slide, and if you can, depending on what presentation software you're using, make it start automatically when you come to the video. Lastly, make sure your video isn't too long, because if you just have a 15 minute video embedded into your presentation, it's no longer your presentation. It's the video. So if you think... Yeah, it's funny you mention that, because I feel like this presentation is kind of going on for too long. So if you don't mind... <laughs> I, it's not, it's not it's my presentation. Shut up. I'm the, shut up. Oh, what, do you, what are you going to... Shut up. Anyway. <laughs> one thing you've probably heard a million times, no, a billion times, <laughs> is tailor your presentation to your audience. This has meaning. This is really, really important. When you are analyzing your slides, looking at your speaking points, you need to answer the question, why do they care about this? What's in it for your audience? You need to put yourself into the mindset of the people sitting in the room listening to you. If it's something, if you can't come up with a compelling answer to that question, it doesn't belong in your presentation. The sad thing is, though, you'll find out when you really start to get good at this and constantly analyze, a lot of stuff you talk about really doesn't relate back to your audience. So what you need to do, and what's your responsibility, is you need to spin it in such a way that they need to care. You want to make them care about the stuff you're talking about. I also wanted to give a quick side note on humor. I'm not a comedian by any means, but one observation I've noticed when uh, looking at the way jokes are planted in presentations, they work great if they relate to the audience. Two weeks ago, Oracle was here, and they gave a great presentation. It was incredible. The recruiter got up in front of everyone and said, your first experience with an Oracle product was probably with this. And he showed a screenshot of PeopleSoft. And then his face got really sad and he said, I'm sorry. Everyone knew what he was talking about because we know what PeopleSoft is and how bad it is. <laughs> That's how you make jokes. You have to make sure they're funny to your audience, not to you. You'll quickly find out that the two aren't the same. They, they, they have very little overlap, or they have overlap in areas you didn't even know were possible. So I want to give a note about group presentations. We do a lot of these on software engineering, so it would be kind of crazy if I didn't mention it. I'm sure you're all familiar with the classic mistake of code integration called uh, Big Bang. The Big Bang. That happens in presentations too. Oh yes it does. People sign you take this slide, you take this slide, you take these slides, and on the day of the presentation, we're all just going to manifest a presentation. It'll just happen. Don't do that. What you should be doing instead is at least have one to two dry runs with your team members. The cool thing about group presentation is, is that your team members can act like audience members. And if they're using the critical skills I'll be talking about later, they can tell you what you need to improve upon. You can work off each other. Uh, another point I want to say just has to do with the way you share control of your presentation. 
In my personal opinion, and in my experience, I'd say one clicker for a whole group is the best because whoever is talking is in control. The person who is talking has the clicker, goes through slides, goes through slides. Then when they're done, they walk over to the person who's going to talk next, hand it off. That person starts talking and controls the presentation. It also communicates to the audience that you need to pay attention to whoever's holding the clicker. So that is the best way. Now, I understand it's a luxury. We're not always in that situation. So if you only have a laptop, at least have the person who's presenting controlling there. Okay? Whatever you do, don't have one person control the presentation. One person controlling and then everyone else here. Because we've all seen this, right? We've all seen this? Yeah, okay. No, go back. It's the worst thing. And by the way, if they do master it, if they really nail it, if they really get someone to control it, they've wasted a ton of time training one person to do something that each person could be doing individually on their own. Same thing goes for demos. If you want to do a live demo, again, I highly recommend whoever is driving uh, speak the points that they want to deliver because if the person who is by the slides, or I'm sorry, by the visual representation of the program, and the person is using it, it they're not always going to be in sync. And if they are in sync, that's crazy. They must have spent an insane amount of time practicing the amount of time that would have been halved if just one person was driving and going through the program. So that's my opinion on group presentations. So now we're going to talk about implementation. I actually start adding this stuff to your presentation. And I'll have you know, you're probably a little surprised, that my slides themselves didn't have a lot of words, but I'm talking a lot. That's because I used an outline, and it'll be in the handout that I'll be giving at the end of this, today's presentation. You can access it online. But the way I built this presentation was initially writing an outline of the speaking points I was going to go over. Then, after I clearly defined the flow of my presentation, the talking points I was going to go over, that's when I started making the visual aids. We're trained, all right, because of PowerPoint. We're trained to start in PowerPoint. We just stub out our slides and put our speaking notes in PowerPoint, and then that's our presentation. We're done. Um, it can be your presentation, but it will probably suck. So what you should be doing instead is taking a more uh, pragmatic approach. And this is such a nerdy analogy. I can't believe I'm going to say this. But uh, think of your presentations like header files and your outline is the actual implementation of the stuff. Your presentations are just pictures, very high-level views of the concepts you're talking about. Then your outline has individual points about what you're talking about. So think of it that way. Check out the link that I will give you in the handout that I'll be giving out to all of you. And a great exercise will be to watch this video when it's uploaded online watch my presentation and see the outline right next to it and see how I played off of it. So definitely try and do that in the future. This is probably the most obvious slide anyone could add <laughs> in a presentation about increasing your public speaking skills is to practice. Why people don't practice is because they think that public speaking is like some sort of God-given gift that some people was just born with the ability to deliver and give great presentations. That's not true. It comes from practicing and rehearsing. The coolest thing about it is if you're doing your presentation correctly with the outline I mentioned earlier that you can play with later, your presentation will be different every single time, just by a little bit. A presentation is not a manuscript. All right? that, is, that is a completely different kind of presentation. And it's why a lot of people have the fear of public speaking, that they're going to get up in front of the audience and draw a blank and just have no idea what to say. That can happen if you're following the outline and you memorize your speaking points and you practice that, you are not memorizing giant blocks of monologues. All you're remembering are little topics, little things you're going to talk about, the things that would normally go in your slides the things that people just put up there and then just start talking about. Uh, that's all you're doing. So remember, if you practice that, you'll be golden. What people also don't realize is that to get, to increase confidence, the best way to do it is to practice. 
By practicing, you become more confident because you know what you're going to talk about. And I know that was probably the most simplistic statement you've ever heard in your life, but it's true. When people don't practice, I just, I, I, it just blows my mind. I don't think that public speaking is some sort of innate gift. It comes from practice. There is no substitute for practicing. And really have some fun with it. Record yourself. Take the skills that I've talked about today and apply them to yourself. What sort of, what sort of verbal fillers are you using? How are you shifting? How are you pausing? What points are you saying? Look at all these things at yourself. And if you can't record yourself, ask your friend to record with you know, their smartphone. So bringing it all together, back at the beginning, I said at the end of this presentation, I wanted you all to have a new critical lens, a new way to look at speakers. We all love TED Talks. Have you ever asked why? Why do you like TED Talks? Is it their content? What is in their content? How are they delivering it? How are they walking about the stage? How are they pacing their presentation? What's their tone? Do they have any jokes? These are all questions you could be asking while you're watching a speaker. Even our professors, anyone. Be a more critical viewer. Next time you walk out of a presentation and say, wow, that presentation was awesome. Why? Why was it awesome? If you walk out of a room, which you likely will, that presentation sucked. Why did it suck? Be able to pinpoint it and it say what could be improved is what will really help you uh, get to a better level of public speaking. And don't just do that to, the, uh, to others. Do it to yourself as well. So uh, the last thing I want to ask you all is by a show of hands, how many people here think they're going to look at presentations differently after today's presentation? Okay, that there's more than one person raising their hand shows me that my work here is done. So thank you for listening and are there any questions.